welcome to the Gnostic Warrior Podcast, broadcasting from GnosticWarrior.com in San Diego, California, to around the world. I'm your host, Mo, and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Gnostic Warrior, Pierre. How are you doing today? Yeah, it's fantastic, and um, thank you for inviting me on uh, on your show. Actually, my I've got an identical twin brother, and he's a great admirer of your work. So, um, so thank you. Great, thanks. And and that was John, right? Uh, uh, no, John's not my twin brother. John is just um, a, a friend who's also my webmaster. So oh, we sure. work closely together. Um, so, seen your work actually before John had reached out to me. You know, mm-hmm. so it's great to have you on the show. And, and as I do before we get in to everything you're doing with your books and so forth, I'd like to get a little background of your history, even to your childhood, if you could kind of give us a background and, and let us know a little bit about that. Okay, well, I became interested in, shall we say, flying saucers and the paranormal after as a child, I had a few, shall we say, paranormal experiences. One was when I was at my grandmother that in an opposite in the field opposite to my grandmother's house whilst I was playing out there was a well it it looked like a silo it looked like a, a, a rocket and it just took off like a rocket and it flew sort of high up but over my head and um and I came back in and I said to my grandma, I've just seen a rocket grandma. And she was, yeah, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, you've seen a rocket, whatever kind of thing. Um, but that actually really impressed upon my mind. And after that, I became very interested in the subject of flying saucers. I think before then, I'd always been interested in um, things like ghosts, even as a child. And uh, with regards to ghosts, I guess I had a passing interest in ghosts because as a child, I saw my dead teacher. What was interesting was that, was that we had an English teacher and he just stopped coming to school one day. And I was like, oh, well, that's a shame because he's a really good English teacher and I really enjoyed his stories. He had this really um, very calming and, and very melodious voice and um, he, he would read stories. And uh, one day um, I was walking up to the stairs because I'd had a detention and it was a class detention and I had to get my um, things from my class. And uh, I went upstairs and I passed him on the stairs and I thought, oh, great, he's coming back to school. Brilliant. And he kind of passed me and walked over the bridge, which was this transparent bridge from the teaching block. Um, And the next day it was announced in assembly that that previous afternoon that he died. And I was like, no, he hasn't died. They've got it all completely wrong. It, it wasn't, I didn't see a ghost because he looked completely physical and he, it sounded physical. He wasn't transparent. It was only many years later that I realized that the majority of ghosts, which are seen by individuals, that they actually appear solid. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think that got me um, also, that kind of reinforced that um, opinion in terms of our interest in the paranormal. Uh, I know when I told my friend, I said, oh, I'm going to have to go to the headmaster and tell him straight that he's got it completely wrong, that our English teacher is alive and everything's okay. And my friend said, no, don't do that. They'll, he'll think that there's something wrong with you and he'll want to get the psychologist in. So he, he kind of uh, talked me out of it. And I kind of, it's one of those regrets. I'm kind of curious what the um, teacher would have thought, actually. I, I think that would have been quite an interesting conversation. So, sure. Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in uh, Yorkshire, so um, that's where I grew up. And I was educated in Wales, so I went to University of Wales. And then um, I um, lived in London for um, about 12 years. So, yeah, it's um, fairly fairly eclectic, really. Um, yeah, sounds like it. And then, you know, when I hear these stories and... Of course, you go up to people that you love and you know and you tell them. And do you feel like you you have this ability to see into this other dimension, possibly a little bit, or connect with uh, this well, information where other people maybe around you aren't so able to do that? I've, I've had what I would describe as supernatural experiences. Um, they really kicked in when I started, when I made the decision that I was going to write a book which turned out to be my first book, The Murder of Reality. 
I had a number of experiences where I was seeing shadow beings and beings of light, and I got a strong impression that I would be given inf information. And, um, and, and that occurred over a number of years, maybe, maybe for about five years, and then it just kind of stopped. So that's where I am at, at the moment. I haven't really had so many, uh, shall we say, supernatural experiences in, in the last 10 years. But, um, but yeah, I had um, experiences such as like, um, well, I was seeing, um, I, I saw a sh some shadow beings and I, I was in kind of, I was in like a trance and I was writing down what they were telling me. And um, I, I asked them where they came from and they said, oh, we come from the earth. And I got the impression, because they speak telepathically, that they meant that they came from inside of the earth. Um, and what was very interesting is that these beings spoke in rhyme. So they didn't, they didn't exactly speak like you or I, but they spoke in rhyme. And their speaking was very enigmatic. It was almost riddle-like. So, um, so yeah, ev everything seemed to be um, have a connotation or an edge. So that was kind of very esoteric, and I saw some beings of light as well. Looking, um, looking back, Pierre, you know, Again, you, you call them beings of light, and, and you mentioned shadows, and I understand you're, you're talking mm -hmm. about this, this other realm or this dimension, and, and you hear of other people you know, talking about similar experiences or, or their own. Mm -hmm. Do you feel they were uh, kind towards humans? What, what was the message? What was you know, five years of doing this? Um, well, yeah, the... The, the being of light gave me a, a symbol, which I don't really want to go in, uh, which is kind of a personal experience. I don't really want to go in into that. Um, but this, um, shall we say, symbol, it, it was something which it took me actually a long time to figure out what it actually meant. Um, and and it, 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 it was basically, the symbol was the uh, barking dog. And I saw a shining being. And later, I understood that this would be serious, and the shining being would be related in the esoteric or the occult tradition to the seraphim. I think what's complicated about um, these type of experiences, and I think you see these entities, they communicate telepathically, and um, typically, when people communicate telepathically, they can see light. And I think that this is sometimes confused. The, um, with a being of light so the person might say okay this is a, a being of light but it's not necessarily I think that that can actually be a psychic confusion because the being is communicating telepathically and, and it's this if you like the signal carrier which is the photon which is light which can make the being either look like light or, or, can, or, conf or can confuse the um, individual who's um, speaking to the being so that I mean that's just um, my um, Im impression um, sure. And, and I know we're we're using human language trying to describe this, you know, so it's it's like we're limited. Right. And we're each trying to. Well, I mean, yourself, you're trying to explain it in your own words. You know, it's it's hard to do that. I, absolutely. I mean, there were also other experiences where I was le um, levitating as well. So I was touching the ceiling and um, I guess it was like an out of body experience, but the difference was was that I was levitating really close to the ceiling and I could touch the artex and I could feel it. So I was never kind of sure whether I was just levitating or whether this was an out of body experience because otherwise it just seemed quite normal. I mean, I wasn't afraid or anything like that. Um, maybe that was a little bit unusual, um, but otherwise I was functioning just normally I could see the television and I was kind of curious because I could control it as well and and so I found that very interesting and there was um, other occasions as well and I don't know that if it's not something that I've ever read about but I really suspect that this is quite common and again I suspect that this might be linked into de dematerialization but I can't really be sure because I've never read about this before but I suspect this is common I would have um, a silver chain and it had a, a, a pendant on and the pendant would always come unfixed. Now, I would never, ever take off the silver chain. And, of course, it had a clasp. And, of course, I was always kind of rationalizing it. Like, well, okay, the clasp may have somehow opened in the middle of the night and it fell off and then it closed. Uh, but it would sometimes, the pendant would turn up in strange places like underneath the bed or, or really strange things like that. And this happened uh, quite a few times. And I became 
Well, spooked is a strong word, but I just thought, well, okay, maybe I'm not supposed to be wearing this chain. So I gave the chain to my brother. And a couple of months later, I thought, you know what, I'm going to get myself an, another pendant. And so um, instead of getting a silver chain, I thought, okay, I'll try something different. I will get um, a leather throng and I'll, I'll get a piece of jade because I like jade. And so I put that around my neck. And um, a number of weeks later, the pendant came off the actual level leather throng, and um, and uh, it, it was still knotted, and it and it was just like completely impossible, absolutely impossible. So the pendant wasn't broken in any way. If you imagine, it was um, it looked like a kidney shape. It was half of a dow with a hole in the middle, and this just ca- just just came off and. A few days later, I, I couldn't because it, the knot was so thick and it had been on for a, a number of weeks or, or months. I couldn't untie the knot, so I had to literally cut it off. So, so then I thought, yeah, okay, I didn't imagine this, and you know, my w- wife saw this as well, so she, she was convinced that that was um, unusual. And um, <laughs> I could perhaps tell you of an experience of what I ha- had in terms of seeing what look like alien beings but again you see this is the problem isn't it when we're dealing with this because even let's say if one has had in interaction at either um, a telepathic level um, a subconscious level and they can also um, impact upon your dreams and communicate through your dreams you're never exactly um, sure and uh, and again you could um, just have a dream in which you're re-remembering something as well and you might actually think that the dream is real when the dream isn't real it's something else so it is actually quite complicated when you're looking at this type of material, which is obviously um, very subjective. So I'm not saying that this was real or um, not real, because really I don't know. Um, but something occurred which actually made me pay attention to this more than what I would otherwise with a dream. What basically happened was was that in my dream, and I have, I've never had this before, but I know from reading literature within um, psychiatry and, um, and and that type of literature, it's quite common to wake up in a dream, but I've never had a dream where I wake up in a dream. And I woke up, and it was very, very dark, and there were two alien beings, um, and, and they were against a um, glass or some type of transparent shield, so they were away from me and they were separated from me. So they were nowhere near me because they were behind this glass. And one of these beings, shall we say, was grey colour. And another was more flesh-like, like the colour of E.T. And they were, they, they looked similar. They could have perhaps been of the same species, but not necessarily. But they were similar enough to be perhaps of the same species. And what I heard and, and what was interesting is the lighting itself was very unusual as well. So it was very black. It was pitch black. But the, the so there was no source of lighting, but they were just lit up normally. And it seemed like that somehow there was a lighting. There was no light, but somehow there was a lighting which would just reflect upon, upon objects and only on objects. But otherwise, everything was dark, which I thought was quite unusual. And... Um, and I heard them, and they said, he's he's woken up. And that was it. Then I went straight back out, un- unconscious again. And uh, I woke up the next day, and I had a very severe allergic reaction, which I'd never had before. And I, I was, like, so worried about this uh, um, allergic reaction, this very severe skin rash, that I was going to go to the doctors with it because it was extremely unusual. Um, but within half a day, it kind of just disappeared. So, so have you? So, and I wouldn't. I, pr- I probably wouldn't have taken. I wouldn't have taken so much um, notice of that dream. I don't think if um, if it hadn't been for the rash. The, it was the rash itself which really made me at, at least take notice of that. But I don't have an opinion whether that was a dream or was it was it just my subconscious mind because I was having an allergic reaction. You know, I. I keep all possibilities open. I'm I'm fairly open-minded, but I think that the fact that I've had um, my necklaces, my pendants dematerialize, has certainly opened me up to the possibility that there could uh, be 
at some level something occurring in terms of maybe that I've dematerialized or as a result of, of some type of interference that there are as certain objects on my person as um, dematerialized, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting, you know, what, what caught my attention and, and did in previous uh, videos that I've watched of yours, and of course you you have your, your books that you've written, you've researched, a, you know, a lot, and over the years you've, you know, done different things, but you had said you had that communication from this, this being that they were from the earth, and then you've done a, a tremendous amount of research and so forth, and you've had other interactions. What are your, your thoughts after all these years in regards to this? Did you look into this more? What are your thoughts on that angle? Well, it's good. Yeah, I'll get back to that question in a moment, but it's kind of interesting how I got into this because, I mean, originally, yes, I had an interest in, in the supernatural, but um, as a young man, I really wanted to be an artist, and um, and that's all I really wanted to do. Um, and as a result of just things not working out, and then I became a, a teacher because I found it increasingly difficult to make money from my illustrations, and then as a result of teaching, uh, then I started to, to write. So it was kind of everything has um, been in a progressive step. And although it's sometimes felt like that it's been a step backwards, everything has moved forward a, at a certain progression. I know that certainly from a child that I've always felt um, strongly motivated. I've always felt, and, I, and certainly at least, by, at least by the time I was 16, uh, I felt that... Um, that well I understood that I was mortal and that it was important to make one's life matter and so I felt very compelled that I wanted to try and achieve something and, and be successful at what you know what I do what whatever that would be so I I, I was kind of I think I've always been very driven and, and very self-motivated um, but this has been very inadvertent but again it, it, the occult and symbolism is something that I tremendously enjoy. And it really is just an extension of what I studied at university, which was um, fine art. And fine art, certainly in the 1990s, uh, was based upon semiotics, which is the deconstruction of the sign. I mean, it looks at political systems of uh, disinformation and propaganda, which is essentially subliminal um, insinuation, which goes then into the realm of language and symbolism and pictorial representation. So... Um, my education has been very, shall we say, complementary for what I actually do now. Uh, I didn't study linguistics, though. That wasn't something that I really, if you like, had an interest in. That's, that has been inadvertent. And again, it's not as though I necessarily think that I'm good at languages. I'm actually better, I think, at pattern recognition. But I think I have, a, a shall we say, an unusual facility for pattern recognition. And so... Uh, when I wrote The Murder of Reality, I was able to deconstruct um, the Indo-European morphology. And actually, I didn't know about morphology when I was writing the book. I referred to them as phonetic switches, um, which was, you know, one of the biggest breakthroughs in um, linguistics is uh, the study of morphology. But I understood this intuitively. And it, to me, it was very much of a no-brainer. And I also... Um, came across polyglottal symbolism. Now, polyglottal symbolism, uh, wordplays which repeat in many languages, it, this is um, a type of um, parallel thought formation. And, um, and, and it demonstrates, or to me it demonstrates, that there is a code within human language. Now, the way, in terms of where I differ from the majority of intellectuals, is they would say that the code within human language, if if indeed there is a universal grammar, and this is not necessarily accepted in all quarters, but increasingly I think it's being accepted. Um, but um, but I argue that this code is external, and that this code has been um, it's been placed into language. Part of this, the reason for placing this code into language, is to control the human subject subliminally through through symbols through the control of language so uh, I describe this as the artifact and this is external and I think also in terms of polyglottal symbols the symbolism it proves once and for all that there is a universal grammar because there's been a lot of um, scholars talking about universal grammar but I have seen no text that actually proves that universal grammar exists 
and uh, my re research into polyglottal symbolism, which is found uniformly in all languages, demonstrates conclusively uh, that, that there is indeed a universal grammar. But where I differ is that this universal grammar is extraneous, that this is something that has been imparted into language, it's something which has been insinuated into language. So, um, so yeah, uh, my study into language wasn't really, when I started researching into this, this wasn't something that necessarily I intended. But because then I had, if you like, a facility for recognizing patterns within language, the next extension to that is recognizing patterns within symbology, because symbols really are based upon the crux of language. Um, symbols are pictorial and words are pictorial and they're phonetic as well. So it combines both the um, phonetic aspect with the image, uh, which is very, very powerful because it's combining both hemispheres of the brain. So it, it really is imprinting a message there through imagery and through um, phonetics. You talk about the control of the human through these symbols and so forth. Who mm. and, and what is doing this? Yeah, I think that's a really in interesting question. We could say that aspects of this control structure are controlled through what are known popularly within um, popular culture now as the Illuminati. Now, although the Illuminati is traditionally traced to the Bavarian um, Brotherhood, um, really what it's coming from much earlier, the term Illuminati is a Latin translation from the Arabic word Aksari, which is a brother of light. Now, it's a wordplay because in the Aramaic, um, Aksari is a brother of an angel. Now, the terminology angel is polymorphic, so Zar, which is uh, the noun for an angel, is um, polymorphic of an alien. So an angel and an alien are synonymous. And therefore, in modern Hebrew, the word Kezar um, is a space alien. K, again, is coming from the um, old e Hebrew word to live. Like So, for example, in the Hebrew, you have a hella K, which is a high creature. A high creature is a Halloween. Uh, the terminology high creature is polymorphic. It can be translated as a high god or, or a, sorry, a living god or a living creature. But um, a, a living god or a living creature, which is high, is, is can be translated or understood as an extraterrestrial biological entity. And again, um, this is going back into the traditions of the Illuminati. The symbol of, Illum of the Illuminati signifies um, Sirius. In the Arabic, Sira is um, the, uh, the sparkling one. It's coming from the etymology of Sara, which is a spark. And again, the um, seraphim are depicted with Sarefa fire. So the seraphim are said Certainly within the astrotheological symbolism, it's certainly strongly connoted that the seraphim originates from Sirius. And also uh, with the jinn as well, the word seraphim is often translated as jinn in, into the Arabic. Uh, a jinn is a spirit, but again, the old Semitic noun uh, jen is a serpent or a word, I'm sorry, a serpent or a worm. Um, but the terminology jinn from jana to hide or to conceals denotes um, a spirit or a supernatural being which is traditionally thought to look reptilian or is um, symbolized with the serpent and again the serpent iconography is closely allied within symbolism to serious symbolism and uh, here we're dealing with uh, a non-human branch of angels which are the seraphim the seraphim um, appear to be reptilian and they are equated in the ancient biblical and the apocrypha traditions with the watchers so, for example, you have sofa for watches related to a seraph. And um, the, it's interchangeable in the apocrypha traditions with the erin. Now, the word erin is polymorphic because er, a watcher, or which is light. So when it's unpointed within Hebrew, the word erin, a watcher, can be translated as a shining one. And the watchers are the shining ones in the testament of Amran. Amran is a uh, father of a nation. Um, it's traditionally Amran is Moses' father. So the Erin is said by Moses' father to have the face like a viper. And therefore they're synonymous or they're one and the same with the seraphim. As we said, Sofa for watch is related to Sarefa, which is fire. Seraph, which is a serpent. Now, the same type of symbology is equated with the high ones or the gods. So if you like, within the Hebrew, the Elohim, which are the high ones or the gods, 
is a cognate of Erin, which is a watcher. Now that same word place, polyglottal, we referred about the insinuation of the artifact within human language. So Theos the God in um, in Greek is is related to Theros a watcher and Phos, which is light. So the watchers um, are equated with the deities or the gods, which in the Greek is Theos and which in the um, Semitic are the Elohim. As we said before, the light signifier is used to denote Sirius. Sirius are equated with the angels, which are deemed to be angelic sailors. So, for example, in the Kabbalistic texts, Ben Sira, the son of a boat, is a denominational of an angel. Now, Ben Sira works on a special type of um, diptych paranomasis. It's, it's a wordplay which works from the um, Hebrew into the Arabic. So, Ben Sira. Sira is the Hebrew word for a boat, but in Arabic, Sira is Sirius. So the sons of a boat are the sons of Sirius. And the sons of Sirius, as we said, were represented as the seraphim, or they were also represented um, as the Elohim. So, yeah, and I think what's important also is that uh, the sons of um, Sirius or the sons of the boat um, are therefore represented as an angel. And so when we go into the Hebrew word malak, an angel, it's polymorphic because malak also means a sailor. So we're dealing here with angelic sailors, and these sailors um, were equated with um, vessels or carriers, which were represented as the opening wheels, which in today's parlance is a flying saucer. I'll get my breath and I'll, I'll let you into <laughs> No, that was, that was great, Pierre. No. What are your thoughts in regards to the Illuminati? There's the conspiracies, you have the barbarian, you have these different sects, and then you have Freemasonry, of course, and, and we see a lot of that symbology. Okay. Yeah, that in itself is a complex subject area, and we could perhaps um, we could split the uh, question into two parts, which are the Illuminati and the Freemasons are the builders, so we'll attempt to do that, I think. The Illuminati, I describe them in my book, Holographic Culture, as the tripartite Illuminati. So there are essentially three orders to the Illuminati. And I think that this is something which has not really been picked upon within uh, modern research. And this has come about through my deconstruction of symbolism, which, as I said before, is linguistic. So within the Illuminati, there are three orders to the Illuminati. There is uh, the human order. So there's a, a, in Hebrew, there's a wordplay between Ishman and Esh, which is fire. It's found in all the languages. You know, in English, we'd say sun, uh, um, sun is in the sky and sun is in a, a son or a descendant. Again, in the Chinese characters, you have this character, which is man, add two accentuations and you have fire. So anyway, going back to the tripartite Illuminati, the three orders of the Illuminati, you have Ishman, which is related to Eshfire, which is the human element. Then you have uh, the seraphic or the non-human element, which can be construed to be alien. Um, this is um, seraph and serepha, which is fire. And then you have the grafted element, which are the neophytes, which is neophytus, or coming from the newly planted, foot on a plant, which is related to thought, which is light. Now, the neophytes are a bloodline which are grafted, and the symbology of grafting bloodlines or stitching bloodlines is found throughout the biblical and the apocrypha tradition. We would describe a clone, as in clon, the Greek word for a twig. Um, but the um, tree or the family tree is used specifically to refer to uh, noble families, which are described as a scion. But a scion is also a, a twig or something which can be grafted. So this is really understood as a grafted lineage and are equated with that which is um, planted. So this is a planted lineage, and it goes really back into um, no, nobility as well. It goes back into the, dis um, the descendants of the boat and the offspring, which are deemed to be human angelic. So, for example, we could go into some of the etymologies. So when the Illuminati refer to themselves as lordship, they're making reference to the fact that they are descended from angels. As we said, Malak an angel is polymorphic of Malak a sailor. Now, Malak an angel is also closely concordant with Melech, which is a king 
Now, these word plays go on in many different languages. So you would have, for example, you would have an archon, which is an angel or a ruler. And an archon, an angel or a ruler, is related to Olcas, which is a vessel, again, which is lordship. Again, archon is related to dracon. It's a word play within the Greek. But I, I think it's found more specifically within the Arabic, because the Arabic word akim, which is a sovereign, um, is related to um, Akan, which is the old Babylonian word for a seraph from Ak to shine. So again, these are all signifiers of the dragon or the shining ones, which go back to the watchers or Sirius. The dragon is represented with the eye, drakos, which is the old Greek word for an eye, coming from the root drakane, which is to, to, to watch or to flash or to shine. So the Illuminati them, themselves are tied in with this, um, with the insignia of the eye, which is used to denote the um, seraphim bloodline, which is represented typically as a shining eye. So, yeah, and I mean, again, in, in the um, Arabic, you've got um, sarif, which is a noble or a lord, again, cognate of seraph. As we said, akim. Uh, a sovereign is a cognate of Akana serpent. In the Greek, Basilios and Basilikos, king and serpent. So, I mean, th these word plays in terms of this grafted lineage, which is correlated uh, with the seraphim, is found um, throughout uh, many different languages. Even in the Japanese, the Japanese emperors were descended from Rujin. Well, the word Rujin, Ru is a dragon, Jin is a man. So it's the same symbology to Chinese, the Persian emperors also, the Persian um, royalty trace their lineage back to the serpent, which is going back to the seraphim and to the idea of this stitched or graft bloodline. At one level, there is the symbology of the Illuminati. The three orders are human, non-human, and this uh, grafted it element the grafted elements if you like are the arbitrators between heaven and earth and the tripartite are shall we say antagonistic they don't always see eye to eye i think that this goes back to um the titanomachy which was a war in heaven which regarded the titans um in which the titans and humanity were um, taken out big time so historically there there is this um shall we say conflict where they don't always agree but they have formed some kind of an uneasy alliance, which I refer to as the Covenant of Worlds, which is really unified through the symbolism of Orion. So if you imagine within the old framework, if you imagine the chi um, Chimera, the Chimera represents this alliance, which is the Covenant of Worlds. So in the um, old Semitic, the word goat um, is related to um, um, the Pleiades. And so the Chimera has this um, goat's body, um, it has a lion's body, a lion's body, which represents Orion, and then you have also the serpent's tail, and the serpent is often shown with canine features as well. And again, this is a signifier of the dog star. So you have these um, three, shall we say, star constellations. The Pleiades are related to the Cherubim, which I refer to as the proto-human angels, which are the human host. Now, within the biblical and the apocrypha traditions, the angels are, shall we say, distinguished between human and non-human angels. And again, this goes into what I refer to as the seraphim cherubim dialectic, which is, shall we say, this dialogue or contention or, and also covenant and contract between these two very different elements which work together but also appear to be antagonistic. And so you've got the Pleiades, which is the human element. You've got Orion, which is refers both to the Adamic, the creation of the Adamic man from the proto-human and also the creation of the Nephilim, which was this unsanctioned bloodline which created the war in heaven. And then you've got Sirius, which are the watchers or the shining ones or the dragons, which are these genetic engineers which go into the symbolism of the builders or the Freemasons. And the etymology of angel again is derived from Amar, which is to talk or to speak, but is related to Amar Bane, which is um, to build. So the, the builders are correlated with the angels who are both social engineers because they construct as in a social construct or is an, are an academic construct, but they're also genetic engineers and they are tied in with the second creation, panspermia. And when we look around, we could say all around us, there would be descendants and, and clones mm -hmm. of these um, same nobility. And how could you tell the difference? Yes, um, I think that, again, and this is um, something which I think my research only just really picks up on, and, and again, but it, it does seem that within, shall we say, the I orders that there are these 
different type, shall we say, between the grafted and the human elements and um, also the non-human as well. So these are real, shall we say, three parts of the Illuminati which go back into the secret traditions in the classical tradition. Now the classical tradition refers to the angelic tradition. Classis is a naval fleet which again pertains to Malak, an angel or Malak, a sailor. This tradition, the, the classical tradition, is classified and is based upon class meaning that one is descended from a boat. The descendants of a boat were these um, opening wheels, which were also represented as shields as well. So the family shield is the symbol of um, a boat, the shield and the boat. Yeah, so the descendants of the boat represent themselves with a shield, which is used archaically to denote a flying saucer. Um, as we said, the classical tradition re relates to the angelic tradition, which can be understood to be the naval tradition, and it goes into the dock of law. It goes into... Parliament, you know, the ship of state, government, gubernatio, to steer a vessel. He, he, again, in the Greek, Uperets is a minister, which is uh, one who steers a vessel or a boat. So uh, these are all symbols, if you like, of the naval or the angelic tradition, which is the classical or classified tradition. Yeah, and I, I think uh, one of the questions I also had, wh what are your thoughts in regards to humanity now? Or, you know, are we all hybrids or who's human, who's not? Huh. You know, if we, we look at all the descendants, there was a lot of wars and so forth. Yeah, you know? uh, the majority of humans on this planet are Adamic. And the Adamic was created. Um, now, this is from my understanding, and it is based on complex etymology. Um, and also trying to analyze the mythology, my understanding of this. And again, uh, when you're dealing with symbols, it's very difficult and very complex to break down these symbols. And it's taken me a long, uh, it's taken me a long time to get to this stage where I can begin to put together some of the fragments. And again, the knowledge that we have is only very fragmentary because we are suffering from amnesia. The human race is suffering from amnesia. And the problem is, is that a lot of what we're being told about um, mythology is just not true. You know, the hieroglyphs are very problematic. I mean, I've looked at the hieroglyphs and they don't make sense. But we're dealing here with a type of deception, a deception which is very cleverly conceded, um, concealed behind word games. So... This this is what we're dealing with. Um, but in terms of uh, the Adamic race, the Adamic race is related etymologically to um, Kadam. And uh, the, again, this is denoting a servant. And so the Adamic race is considered to be a servant. Now, the Adamic race was uh, created at the foot of Orion, um, but they are strongly correlated with Mars. And it does seem like that they either fled to Mars or they went to Mars and Mars was destroyed. And so therefore, in this ancient Semitic language, there is a correspondence between Adam, Adam, which is red, and Mahadim, which is Mars, literally um, from out of Adam. So the Adamic man um, originally was understood to be a Martian. Now, again, this is why in the Arabic, Khadam is to um, destroy or to annihilate. And this was because Mars was destroyed. And it seems like from picking up the pieces from the Zoroastrian tradition that the seed of um, man, which went from Orion to Mars, his seed was stored within the receptacle in the moon and then was transferred or transplanted on the earth. And this um, reseeding of the human race as we said before, there was a proto-seed. So if you read the Quran, for example, um, Adam is created from um, a drop of sperm. Now, why was Adam created from a drop of sperm if we're dealing with the um, absolute? If we were dealing with the first creation, with the absolute creator, Adam wouldn't have been created from a drop of sperm. He um, So the, the reason why is because his um, lineage was taken from a proto-human. And again, uh, from looking into this and thinking about this a great deal, um, it seems to me that the Adamic man was created because the proto-humans are not, shall we say, genetically viable with the seraphim, but the Adamic man appears to be genetically viable with both the cherubim and the seraphim. And so it seems like that as a product of this um, covenant of worlds, which meets with Orion, um, which is also at the source of the controversy because of the Nephilim, Nephilia, which is Orion. Again, the Nephilim are also referred to as the Jibrim, Jibar, which is Orion in, in Arabic. But as a result of these contention, there was a covenant made and uh, the human race was then planted on the earth. And uh, it's tied into a secret history of humanity. Homer writes about this. And again, 
Homa it means homologous, so, you know, that which is the same is where we get Homo sapien. This is the humanist tradition. And the humanist tradition is very separate from the seraphic tradition. And it is at the basis of all the conflict because the priesthood is split. And this is one of their secrets within the priesthood. They split their orders between non-human learning, which is represented by the seraphim, and then human learning, which is um, represented by the cherubim. I refer to this as the seraphim cherubim dialectic, and it is at the basis of all the secret societies. Each secret society traces its origins or its learnings either back to the seraphic source or to the human element. I think it's best conveyed or it's best expressed within the um, classical tradition. As we said, classis is this naval fleet uh, which denotes um, the angelic tradition. So, for example, in Greek philosophy, you have the Pythagorean Euclidean dialectic. Now, Pythagoras, Puthosagoras, is the speaker of the serpent, which is the seraphic tradition. And then you have Euclid. Now, Euclid is famous for writing uh, the elements of geometry. Um, and it was said that there were no royal roads in terms of uh, Euclid's uh, research. But again, this was referring to this grafted lineage. This is because the etymology of Euclid comes from the Arabic word. So it's a diptych paranomasia again from the Greek into the Arabic. Euclid in Arabic is to copy or to ape. Now, at one level, this is because mathematics or geometry copies our apes, the external world. But at the other level, Euclid to copy our ape is related to the Arabic etymology, Kurd, which is an ape. So this is referring to a humanist tradition, which is very distinct um, from the Pythagorean tradition. And we find the split within the priesthood, whether it's the Sunni and the Shiite, the Protestant and the Catholics, they're all coming down to these, um, shall we say, sectarian splits between these angelic um, orders, which are part of the host or the angelic host. Yeah, you, you mentioned before an alliance, and then we see these same priesthoods that you mentioned, you know, coming together and an ecumenical movement happening all around the globe and uh, mm. different brotherhoods meeting and ex exchanging relics, as a matter of fact, the Orthodox and the Catholic Church. What are your thoughts in relation to that? Yeah, I mean, there is a, a splitting, and I think the contention, the real contention amongst the Elohim, and it seems like that they themselves are not decided, and this is why there is contention, and this is why there is still conflict, disagreement, and war. But essentially, from what I can understand, there are two, uh, within classical philosophy, there are two schools of thought. If you like, there is um, the school of thought from Zeno. He wrote Zeno's Republic. Zeno, Zenos, is that which is strange or alien. Again, as we said before, the alien is used as a synonym of an angel. So in the Aramaic, Zar is an angel, um, but it's polymorphic of Zar, which is an alien. So Zeno himself was an alien, and this is referring to the fact that he was angelic. Now, he wrote Zeno's Republic, in which he argued that uh, men, even from common backgrounds, should be allowed their, um, that there should be a meritocracy in which even men from um, the common background, so not from a noble background, should be permitted into um, seats of government and should also be allowed to control the state as well if they earn that right through their competence. Now, this was actually a major real re reappraisal because before then it was the kings who were the mediators between heaven and earth. And this um, republic, if you like, has been the um, source of civil war across across the world, really. I mean, the occult history, I mean, warfare is about occult history, and it's an occult history which is veiled through symbolism. It's a type of private discourse. And so this is what we're seeing in the world. I mean, the, the pertinent question is, is do men rule themselves or um, are men ruled by the Elohim in which there are mediators or arbitrators, which are this grafted element, this monarchical element, as we said, the archons, Alcas, which is a vessel, which would be lordship. Do they rule? Do they rule the world? This, this is the this is the um, contention at the moment. It's behind all of the conflicts, and it's it's behind would, the secret history. Yeah, would the you know current coronavirus epidemic well, be related to this at all, in your opinion? I think anything politically is related to this, but this is a veiled history. Um, I think even when you look at political ideology, you look at Marx, well, the etymology of Marx means Martian, which is the Adamic man, as we said, Mahadim is Mars, Adam is red, Adam. So you've got Marx and Engels. Well, Engels is the Anglo-Saxon word for an angel. So again, it's going back to this angelic tradition. So um, 
Yes, I, I think the world is very complicated. And I think also in terms of um, things such as, shall we say, the European Union, we can't really, whether you think the European Union is a good or a, or, or a bad idea, I mean, I, I, I think the unification of, of countries is not necessarily a bad idea. But the problem is, is we don't have disclosure. People don't know about uh, what lordship means and that there are these grafted lineages and so people are in in the dark and this has led to the fact that humanity has not really been able to represent its own best interests and we see this with the poverty on the earth now this shouldn't you know three quarters of the earth goes hungry and this shouldn't really be a, a major issue because we're intelligent enough to actually feed ourselves a lot of this comes down to structural engineering and it comes down to these um the dialectic again. So, you, for example, you've got these partitions all the time between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. Uh, you have the partition within um, Korea, within tai, um, Taiwan and China. So, uh, within Berlin and, and East and West Germany. So, these partitions are created artificially, and, and again within Vietnam as well. So, these these partitions are created um, politically and they're artificial and were created as a, a part of the dialectic. The dialectic is, if you like, this um, dialectic between the seraphim and the cherubim, but at another level represents the um, conscious and the unconscious mind. In the ancient world, the conscious and the unconscious mind was the rational and the irrational mind, which was the daemonic mind. The daemonic mind is the interface between, again, the telepathic interface between heaven and earth. In the Arabic tradition, this would be the karin. Kari means telepathic. So they instill thoughts within um, w within humanity. And again, there is a close correspondence within the Arabic between um, Quran, which is the recitation, and um, Kara, which is to read, because again, reading is a form of telepathy. You can read somebody's mind. So there's a close cognate in the Arabic as there is within the English. And so the tradition that um, the uh, spirits, again, inspiration is coming from the etymology of spiritus, which is a spirit, which in the Arabic would be um, a jinn or a jinn, a serpent or a worm. As we said, they're co connected to the watchers. So a watcher, seraph, which is a serpent, serepha, which is fire. Why? Because they communicate through light, and light is, is the means of uh, the carrier signal in which they can communicate complex ideas and, in, and transpose, transpose those ideas into um, people's heads telepathically. What I find interesting, you know, I, I've been researching myself for the last 10 years. I, I've gone down, you know, a lot of the uh, research, research subjects that you're talking about and, of course, have interviewed, you know, hundreds of people and um, what i'm finding is it seems like you know people like you that are, are experts and again i i mean no offense oh, but you I'm seem not, to be I'm connected not. yeah no you seem to be connected um in this light meaning you're you're getting uh communications um you know years ago and then you're else you're also able to communicate um about it and research where people um don't have the same understanding that that I don't know. It just seems like I think this has come through hard work. I mean, I'm persistent and I'm hard working, and I just haven't given up. It's you know, it's mm -hmm. I, I quit my teaching job so I could do this full time, and it wasn't e easy, and it isn't easy. You know, it's not. I've I've so I've had to make compromises within my life. I personally think I've always felt this that if you look for the answers, that you will find the answers. I don't think that the answers are beyond humanity. You know, I think that this can be deconstructed. It can be fully understood. I've only got a very small um, piece to this puzzle. It's an immense puzzle. It's a very complicated puzzle. But I do believe that through the deconstruction of what I refer to as scaphology, uh, I also refer to this as new ufology. Um, scaphology is the deconstruction of angelic boats or angelic vessels within the religious or mythological tradition. Again, it's dependent upon new ufology, which is um, the deconstruction of occult symbolism. So I think w if we begin to um, use these tools, then it's uh, we can really begin to um, reevaluate what the information that we have, first of all. Because again, if you want to understand the classical tradition, you have to understand angels who were viewed as sailors. But 
if you start talking about that the angels are sailors, then one is seen as being conspiratorial, but one is not being conspiratorial, one is just referring to the ancient languages in a very literal way in terms of deconstructing the etymology. So I would say it's the scholars themselves who are at a serious disadvantage because they haven't gone into this, shall we say, deep enough. And I think one of the reasons is, is that the information itself is controlled through, I refer to them as the disciparati, the deceivers, now, the etymology disciparati is related to a disciple, so a disciple is actively deceived. And so this is the problem that we have, is not only is there an amnesia with mankind, but we're also being actively deceived. But the answers are already encoded there within the symbolism. So at one level, we've had disclosure for thousands of years, but it's only really been a partial disclosure, because this disclosure has only has been private, it's been based upon a private discourse. Yeah, a private discourse amongst the the Illuminati, the nobility. Or? Yes, that's correct. Yes, the aristocracy. So, what do you what do you believe is the end game for for humanity? I mean, we have again. I, I mentioned the coronavirus. We're all in lockdown. It's uh, pretty interesting yeah. times right now. Yeah, I, I think I think you could get three very different, distinct answers from the three different sections of the Illuminati. Uh, I'm not even sure that they themselves can agree. I think if we can get our act together as a species, we can become a holographic culture. Now, my book, Holographic Culture, talks about species which have deconstructed the mechanics of uh, waveform reality. So the seraphim are a holographic culture. Yes, they use, shall we say, flying saucers, which are physical objects. We know that they're physical because within the symbolism, they're buried underneath temples and they were hidden and they were valued by the priesthood. So, for example, in the Roman mysteries, uh, an ant seal, which was a type of shield, fell from heaven. Again, it's coming from the etymology for a missile in the Arabic. Now, the missiles was a type of flying saucer because in the ancient world, we, we think of a missile as something which is long and thin, but within the ancient world, what they would do is they would take these large um, shields and they would fill them up with, usually with burning sand or, or burning excrement. And uh, they would fling them at the enemy and they would use these shields to destroy fortifications or to sink um, boats or vessels. And so they were like giant frisbees which would go hurling through the wall, through through the air. And so they f therefore... They were traditionally represented um, in, in conjunction with the opening wheels. So the two main, shall we say, signifiers are the opening wheels, which are um, a type of spinning wheel, which is a flying saucer, or a spinning shield. Now, the terminology missile is related in uh, the English to the word missionary because the missionaries were inspired by emissaries who were angels who came from missiles, which were these flying shields, which belonged to Pleon, a boat, or Opelon, which is a shield. And again, there's a correspondence in the Greek between Theos, a god, and Thur um, Thurios, which is a shield. And the shield r refers typically often it's combined with the serpent. So, for example, when you have uh, the opening wheels, the opening wheels are tied in with the serpent and you'll have a throne. And sitting on the throne there is usually an, a humanoid or a human being. Typically, they may be carrying a sword as well. And this would denote the seraphim cherubim dialectic or, or the seraphim um, cherubic or cherubic host, which is human and, and non-human. And I think that that in itself is very interesting when you take it back to modern uh, UFO cases, because the modern UFO cases often talk about that there are human and non-human aliens. And this is the same found within the ancient world. But the symbol of the shield is very, very interesting, because when you look at uh, Greek statues, for example, of the goddesses, uh, they often have shields. And behind the shield, there is a serpent. And this is actually working on the Aramaic wordplay. And again, usually within symbolism, it's always uh, the, it's always one step ahead. So if you're looking at Greek symbols, then you're going to have to look at Arabic and Aramaic. Um, again, if you were looking at the Roman mysteries, you'd have to go into the um, Greek. So everything is always encoded through diptych paranomasia, wordplays which are working in multiple languages. But as I said, within the Aramaic, you have the shield. Now, the etymology of shield in the Aramaic is Juna, which is a shield, is related to the etymology of Jana, which is to hide or to conceal, because the shield, it conceals one. It's, it's a guard. It protects one. Um, and it's also related to Jinn, 
which can be represented as Jen, which is a serpent or a worm. So here we're dealing here with the seraphic host. Well, who are the seraphic host? Well, they are the seraphim or they are the, the angelic sailors. Malak, an angel, is uh, Malak, a sailor. And again, when you go back into the traditions of Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of the host, who's referred to hundreds of times within the Bible, uh, the etymology of Sabaoth host is related to um, Saba, which is an army. Um, then you've got Sephoth, which is a serpent or a seraph. And then um, it's a cognate again of Sephet and Sevet, which is a crew, and Teva, which is an ark or a, or a vessel. So the Lord of the host in particular, Sabah host, um, Sephet, a serpent, was the Lord of the seraphic host. And therefore, the angels themselves were deemed to be non-human or, or typically non-human, but often combined with the cherubim, which were this human faction, which were underneath the seraphim in the command structure. And again, I think when you look at the etymologies of Yahweh Sabaoth, you know, Yahweh, um, Yahweh Malak, he was referred to, so he's referred to as an angel, and he's also um, referred to as Malak Elohim as well. So the angels are referred to the Elohim, or a high angel, or a, um, a messenger god, or a high god. You know, these are all polymorphic um, wordings. So the angels are seen to be um, deities or gods, which can be un linked into the Watchers, you know, Theos, a watcher, is Theos, a god. In the Aramaic, Elohim, the gods or the high ones, is related to Erin, which is a watcher, which is a cognate of Awim, which are the serpents. So, um, so yeah, the Lord of the host can be understood to be the Lord of the Seraphic host. And indeed, in the symbology, he's represented as a serpent as well. And this would actually make sense if he is the commander of, of the Seraphic host. So, for example, Yahweh now um, is represented according to um, the scholar Bullinger. Now, Bullinger wrote the commentaries of the um, King James Bible, so he's a very highly regarded scholar. He said that the transliteration of Yahweh um, came from the etymology of Eya. Now, Eya is the old Aramaic verb for um, to be. So, um, Eya, Asher, Eya, I am that I am. Now, so Yahweh referred to himself as Eya, which is the verb to be. So the connotation is of a being. But Eya is a word play on Aya, which is a serpent, which would connote a seraphic being. And again, the Elohim were described as living creatures and Elake, a high creature. But again, the word play also operates with Yahweh's other name. He's also referred to as El Shaddai, which is almighty God. Now, El Shaddai is coming from the root Shed, which is a goblin ghost ghoul or a demon and, and again when we went back into the etymology of Aya which is Yahweh and um, Aya which is a serpent Aya is also a close cognate of Aya which is a goblin in the Arabic so it's very interesting that there is this connotation with the representation of the serpent or the seraphim which is connected to the cult of uh, Yahweh yeah, you know, I want to kind of relate this to, you know, my studies a little bit. I, you know, have been researching, you know, microorganisms and so forth, what, you know, inhabit our our bodies, right? And I find it interesting that we have different ones and different races, you know, have different uh, organisms within their body. And then we could say our DNA, our DNA is related to that. And they're they're very minute, and then they're all around us at the same time, and we can't see them with our eyes. And now, you know, mm -hmm. science is talking about dark matter, and that mm -hmm. there's this these filaments that are literally all around us at all times, and these organisms and so forth. Would you relate any of these different holographic universes to any of these organisms or this dark matter um, that you know the scientific part of it? I don't know if your research ever went into those areas, Pierre? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. My understanding of this would be based on um, studying Pythagoras. So Pythagoras talked about the Pythagorean monochord. Now the monochord is a string. Um, at the highest level, it, it vibrates at the quickest vibration, which is the spirit. And at the lowest level, it, um, it vibrates um, at the vibration of matter. This is why when we talk about, oh, somebody's got a high vibration, nobody really knows where it originates from. Well, I'm telling you, in the occult tradition, it originates from Pythagoras. Now, this is very interesting because the strings, and the, the Pythagorean string can also be subdivided into notes, and these different notes uh, correlate to different dimensions. 
And so the universe is interpreted to, according to Pythagoras to be like a, a vibrating string with multiple dimensions. And this obviously informs um, quantum physics and uh, the idea that the universe is also like a hologram. And I think that this is useful. It's a useful metaphor to describing holographic cultures. I think we sometimes got to be a little bit too careful about tripping up over language because, you know, we say things all the time, don't we? Like, oh, the Big Bang. But um, if it came from a singularity, it can't have been big. And if it was in a vacuum, then there wouldn't have been a bang. So, you know, you've really sure. got to be, you've got to be kind of careful about the language that you use. So, yeah, um, we're dealing with a holographic culture. They've deconstructed the mechanics of waveform reality. So that means that they can appear as living creatures, an LK in the biblical tradition, but they can also dematerialize as a high spirit, a Ruach Elohim, also in the biblical tradition. So the Elohim are both physical, but they've deconstructed. Not only have they deconstructed time and space, and these are important integers, but I argue that once you deconstruct time and space, then you uh, then you also deconstruct what Plato referred to as the um, the imaginal realm or the or the universal realm of universal forms. Now, the universal realm of universal forms is this implicated order. It's the order of ideas, and these ideas are materialized through the aeon. As, and the aeon is a concentric circle which can be represented in quantum physics as a hologram. But the implicated order is represented physically um, in the explicated order. So the realm of ideas is the imaginal realm and the imaginal realm is the spiritual realm. And this is why, and, and this is my understanding from reading near-death experiences, this is why when one dies, um, one's incursions into the spirit realm are very hallucinogenic, but they're not hallucinogenic in terms of oh the brain is dying as what well. we're always told all the time all the time by the skeptics um it's um it's hallucinogenic because you're entering into the realm you're entering into the imaginal realm the realm of ideas which is the spiritual realm which is the implicated order and this is why meditation a part of uh, the practices of meditation is to realign oneself to the dream realm because if you can control your dream then you can control physical reality but also when you die you can also control your next incarnation both in the future and the past because it's possible for you to incarnate in the future or the past because the time um, doesn't exist so if if you are unable to control the dream realms then the soul can be overwhelmed the soul I won't say dies, but it's, shall we say, overwhelmed by the realm of ideas. It becomes lost. So, um, so yeah, this is all about um, understanding the dream realm. And therefore, when one is in a dream, one if one does not have control of one's dream, then one is uh, lost within one's dream. One finds that the illusion is um is is real you know you can be you can be in a dream and you can be married to a different person and not even question that reality and yet according to you, your recollection once you wake up you may you'll think well why would i think that i was married to why was i married to that in person when i've never even seen them before so again this is the imaginal realm so this is this is my take upon it but um so the imaginal realm these um, entities can interface with this realm which is the realm of ideas i think this is also why they're interested in emergent systems because the emerg emergent systems are systems of evolution and this is where um the universal realm of ideas are which is a spiritual realm and again these entities can then um come through through the shamanic tradition because they can go not only can they um exist outside of time but they can go into the spirit realm and they can also be telepathic but yeah they can also be physical and so we're at this conundrum um we have this conundrum within ufology at the moment um where ufologists argue you know um so a ufologist will say oh yeah the, the physical and another ufologist will say no they're not physical i don't want to talk to you when well, actual fact they're both um and uh, the symbolism of the seraphim shows us that astrotheologically they were equated with the star system, Sirius, but the convergence between the races were identified with Orion. Hence the symbolism within Mas Masonic symbolism of Orion. 
Yeah. What research have you you found in regards to Jupiter? You know, I, I've researched, you know, again, during similar lines and you, you hear, you know, Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, you know, my father is Jupiter. Uh, sure. Jupiter was known as a god. Yeah, well, Pater is father, isn't it? So there's the wordplay. Well, OK. okay. Um, I think that's quite a complicated subject. I mean, in the Islamic tradition, there are seven heavens. But again, this is kind of working on lots of different word plays. I mean, yes, at one level, the seven heavens are related astrotheologically to the seven planets. Each of the seven planets have archontic rulers, which again are symbolic or personifications. Jupiter is the ruling god, which is in, shall we say, perpetual conflict with Saturn, which would be connected to Saturnalia or Satan. So again, we're dealing here with an allegorical discourse. But we're, again, when we're dealing with the seven heavens, there's a correspondence with Sabara star, which is also related to the roots seven. And so this would denote the Pleiades. And the Pleiades is, shall we say, the area of contention where the angels between the human and the non-human angels um, fell out and in which the covenant was set up within Orion. But again, you've got the seven musical notes and you've got um, the spectrum as well. And, um, and so the unification of sound and light uh, which is connected to the seven heavens, which would again be connected to um, um, the monochord and these different dimensions. So it's extremely convoluted and it's working at many different levels. And I think it's really important for your audience to try and appreciate that a symbol isn't just uh, a personification of one idea. I think a symbol is really like an encyclopedia. It compacts, compacts multiple ideas and when you begin to unravel those ideas, you realize that it's very sophisticated. So, for example, if we went back to the symbolism of Saba, which is a star, which is connected to Saboaf, which is the angelic host in the Arabic. Um, but as we said, Saba is also connected to Saba, which is the morning, which is the morning star. The morning star rises and points to um, Sirius, which is also the brightest um, planet within um uh, within our solar system. So it's used as a, a covert signifier of Sirius, which again goes back into the Luciferic traditions. La Sapa, which is to tell. Lucifer in the Latin Lux Fair, which is the light bringer. And the Greek Phosphorus, which is um, the light bringer. So, or the light bringer is another symbol of um, Sirius. So these um, symbols and signifiers, and again, um, Zev, which is a wolf, is connected to Saba and Sibulla, which would be the oracle priestess, which again is connected to the veneration of um, the dog star. And we, in the church as well, a priest will wear a dog collar. Our military wear dog tags. These are all symbols of the dog star, which is the seraphic tradition, the seraphic host. Yeah, and Whoops. then you had the, the back in the well. old... Yeah, Whereas, and then uh, you so. had... An, an, in ancient Greece, you had the Cynex, you know, and so forth. And then um, I think Khan is also related to, to dog. You have, um, so yeah. I don't know if you, you knew that. The Cynex, yeah, the Cynex are related to the dog, and they would use the dog signifier as, as a signifier of the dog star. Correct. And the um, Spartans were connected to the humanist tradition. And it's kind of interesting. And again, this is not really my expertise, which is, political occult philosophy this is something which is a very specialized and something very distinct again i don't really think that there are many good commentators on this because it's they don't really understand the symbolism well enough do you have to understand the ancient languages to go back into the symbolism but it does seem to me that certainly within some of the humanist um, traditions that they are like the spartans they would they Basically, Athens, um, they kind of split off. They had a political center which controlled the politics and the discourse and the trade and the laws. And then they had a warrior class, which were the Spartans. Now, the Spartans seem to represent the humanist tradition. And often within, shall we say, warlike cultures, uh, there is often very strong humanist elements. And it, and it makes me wonder whether this is our copying the hierarchy of the seraphim. So it's almost like in order to try and beat these guys which are unbeatable i mean in the ancient in the ancient greek they were referred to as unbeatable this this force that they take on this highly militaristic order of um trained soldiers so that's um one level 
Yeah, and explain to the audience, Pierre, you know, in regards to the humanists, because, you know, when people think of Spartan and the first word that comes to my mind is warrior, you know, that goes out and kills, you know, and you hear stories in history that they were trained, you know, from seven years old, literally to be warriors and, and live with nothing and, and be very vicious. Um, so where is the human, you know, we, we you don't associate humanist with a Spartan warrior kind of like... I don't think most people would. So kind of explain that to the audience. Well, I, I think, again, it is duplicitous. And again, the symbology is always very complicated because often when you're talking about the humanist, there are also seraphic elements. So Spartan, the word tan in Hebrew is a, a crocodile or a dragon. It's related to the Arabic etymology tanim, which is a dragon. So again, these are not necessarily very clear-cut distinctions and i think often it's very context dependent particularly when you're dealing with the secret societies so you for example if you were having a, a grafted bloodline right a grafted bloodline can be very duplicitous in the, the way they represent themselves. Sometimes they represent themselves with human signifiers, saying that they align themselves with the Caribbean tradition, and sometimes they would align themselves with the Seraphic tradition. And so, again, that can be context-dependent. So, as I said, um, sometimes we've got to be careful about being too literal in, in what we say, because uh, with symbolism, what we're really dealing with is switching signifiers. And so the symbol itself can switch. Uh, the symbol is really... A device of subterfuge and it's really used to keep the uninitiated out of the circle of knowledge the circle of knowledge can be understood to be an opening wheel which was the early word for a flying saucer as as as, as far out and as ridiculous as that sounds well you think of the word nobility it's 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 basically able to know right so <laughs> they're the ones that yeah, knowledge that, controls everything, yes. right? And remember, there's a close cognate because of the morphological switch between the B and the V within the Indo-European languages between noble and naval, which again is going back to lordship, which are going back to the high ones, which is highness, which is the monarchical structure. Yeah, it's interesting you say naval because uh, I've done a lot of research on, on Crete and that used to be called the naval of the world, basically, and, and that's where all our navies uh, come from you know we had the the Phoenicians and the Cretans building boats there and we have the stories of the the Masons and, and Hiram and so forth what do you know about that to be honest I know very little about that okay, uh, sure. I think, um, um, Freemasonry is absolutely a fascinating subject but it's a science in itself and I mean that's not it's not my area of expertise but it, it, it is something that if you take the basic languages and you begin to deconstruct it it is something that you can gradually unpick for yourself the symbols are there they're out in the open the most secret words within freemasonry are all emblazoned on the buildings and are on their insignias i also think that some of these words are part of the artifacts and they're if you like some of their highest adepts are victims of mind control so they may not necessarily be in full control of their faculties because not necessarily that they've been indoctrinated, but there may be sort of um, sinister forces which may be controlling um, these um, these elements. And again, the etymology of sinister is kind of interesting because the word sinister meaning left-handed, but in the Greek, the word aristocrat is related to left-handed. And so the aristocrats or the nobility, if you, if you look, they're always left-handed very very high percentage of them are left-handed and this is again um, a degree of their um, bl um, bloodline it, it's showing that they condition the rest of the world to be right-handed and they themselves are special so they're left-handed interesting does this have to do anything with the the left and the the right side of our, our brains have you researched that at all or um, well the left side is linguistic and creative and the right side is um, mathematical if uh, if i've got that the right way around but it, anyway, i think it's the, the opposite actually I, I, yeah i'm but, i'm left yeah actually i'm left-handed which means that that is the right hemisphere of the brain and left-handedness is creativity and um language yeah well i think with the illuminati yes they're left-handed and again they play with language language is controlled it controls behavior um I, I think that their system of lear learning with the um, seven noble arts, uh, um, quadrivium, um, again, was used to, shall we say, synthesize the two hemispheres. So they're not dependent on just one side of thinking. Their thinking is, is totally synthesized. They have learned how to think correctly in a balanced way. There's a lot of... 
a lot of left-hand people too are ambidextrous. They could use both their their right too. I've known a lot of people like that. Are you yourself can you use your right pretty well? Uh, yeah, I'm left-handed. I'm well. Again, I, I think certain things. I play the guitar right-handed. So the left-handed person has to adapt in a right-handed world, and that usually means uh, that they sometimes have to learn skills with their right hand. So. I find it difficult to use left-handed scissors because I've just learned how to use right-handed scissors. So this is, but I, I think I'm actually strongly left-handed, but I have learned to adapt in a right-handed world. Again, I think what you're seeing now is that there are less people who are left and uh, there are more people who are left-handed. And I think that this in itself is symbolic because we're moving towards what is the synthesis. This is the synthesis of the dialectic, the seraphim Caribbean dialectic, the two traditions between the angelic traditions of the humanist traditions and the non-human angels of the Pythagorean Euclidean dialectic. So we're entering into this now. And so we're seeing the removal of gender. Uh, with the synthesis this is part of the condition it's part of the synthesis uh, part of this will be i believe probably ultimate disclosure which is the apocalypse apocalyptic which is to um, unveil or to disclose which will part of what the christians refer to as the rapture rapture is a uh, well rapier is a reptile rap here is to rape or to abduct and again, the serpents are connected with rape and abduction because in the Hebrew and the Arabic, you've got the diptych paranomasia on the Arabic word hanas, which is a serpent. But in the Hebrew, anas is a rapist. So the serpents or the seraphim are connected with abduction as found with Yahweh Sabaoth. Sabaoth is the angelic host, but Sabaoth is related to Sab, which is abduction. It's the same with the traditions of the harpies. Apoe is an abductor. The Apoe are connected to Opalite, a soldier. Erpaton, which is a reptile. So, um, And do, does this rape, does this come from the, the holographic realm? Is this where they operate, or are they oh, operating no, through... I, I, no, I think that this is actually um, at, the, at, the, um, at the physical level. Um, so they... With humans and, uh, and yeah, hybrids uh, and... Okay. Yeah, this, this is, yeah, so we're dealing here at different levels, which in the Roman traditions would be the nymphs and nymphaleptos, which is to be stolen by the nymphs. But again, the word nymph, which is a bride, is closely related to nubia, which is to marry. And um, again, are correlated with the nubagene of the offspring of a cloud, nubes, which is a cloud. So... Those who originate from a cloud, again, the cloud can be used in the um, Arabian traditions to denote the jinn, uh, because the jinn are said to materialize as smoke. Um, and again, the shadow beings, I think, are dematerialized entities that are not fully formed. So they're not actually showing their, shall we say, true materialization. When they communicate, they can communicate using light. So the beings can then appear to be light. But they can materialize physically, and they can materialize as physical entities. And what type of bloodlines have you researched? Uh, what type of bloodlines these might be um, ruling the world or, or the Illuminati? You hear of the, you know, the 13 bloodlines, I believe. Um, I, get, I get this asked. I get this question asked regularly and I say I'm not a biologist, so I really don't know. Gotcha. Yeah, it's no, it's it's just interesting because I when I look at the my blood, history, the lines, yeah, the bloodlines interconnect around the world. Are that that much I am sure about, and they they know the symbolism and they communicate through the symbolism as they do within Parliament. They're always using veiled language. But please tell me a little bit about your um, um, origins, your bloodline. Yeah, so I I wanted to you know I, I've shared it before through my podcast. You know, I I wanted to research where my family came from. You know, they came from Canada. You know, I knew my last name, didn't know much other than my, my grandparents who are from Quebec, mm -hmm. you know, in, in Montreal, in Canada. And then I, I had a, a blood test and so forth and got my DNA uh, done about, I'd say, eight years ago. And then I found out that I'm a Phoenician and Greek Helene descent. But in any event, I, I researched my specific family and traced them through the different continents back to France and actually Ireland and then back towards uh, Crete and Greece and um, Egypt, and they're all involved in you know the things that you're talking about, from Freemasonry to the priesthood and you know stuff like that. And um, you know I'm just a regular guy here in you know the United States. I you know barely making a living, but you know this stuff has always interested in me. And then yeah. you know I find out about this inter uh, this this information. So it's always 
really mm-hmm. interested me and I've, you know, I'm really interested in, in Freemasonry and the Illuminati as well. So just wondering why a lot of us seem to be drawn towards this and, and, you know, if that's part of it being part of our heritage, possibly, you know, have you ever done, looked into your, your background here? Um, a, a little bit. Um, apparently, yeah, I'm re- apparently I'm related to Captain Webb, who was one of the, who was the first Englishman to swim across the English Channel. Um, but mm-hmm. not that, no, not that much really. That was just a, a family story. I think also you're interested in these occult areas of expertise. It's probably coming through the bloodline because the blood contains memories. And so um, your interest in these areas, I think, is as a result of that. I, I also find that people who have, shall we say, Illuminati members within their families often are interested in the occult. Now, I mean, my my father, he claimed that he was a Knight Templar. And um, I didn't find out about this until I was 40 years old. I mean, so, and and he, he told me when he was dying and he said he would never, ever told me because he'd made a vow not to tell anyone um but he he told me because well he said i'd 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 earned the right to know after i'd written my book the murder of reality he was impressed by the book and he said i'd earned the right to know um now i um he was i don't know when he was initiated maybe it was between the ages of uh, i think he would have been about 18 to 20 and he, he was the bodyguard to the Queen's first cousin in Saudi Arabia, Sir Michael Lefanu. And it, I think it was only for a very short time. And that, that was it. I don't think, I don't know if he had any contact outside of that after that. I, I presume not, but I really don't know. I don't agree with the secret societies. I'll be straight with you, I don't, because the secret societies are a part of what's, they're, they're a part of the problem. Secrecy has been used to propagate all, all kinds of crimes on this planet. And so I don't agree with secrecy. And um, I'm a great believer in the Republic in terms of men representing themselves. And I, uh, you know, I'm, I, I voted against the European Union, but I didn't. I wasn't necessarily against the idea of a European Union. I was against the idea of men not being able to represent themselves, and this idea that we don't have disclosure about extraterrestrials, and therefore, as human beings, we are unable to represent ourselves. I think in the Tower, uh, the biblical story of the Tower of Babel was a wonderful metaphor. You know, the men got their acts together. They started speaking the same language. They stopped fighting each other. They said, come on, let's build a tower. And then the Elohim came down. They mixed up the language, which is a, mythologically the creation of the artifact, and um, and stopped men because they said that uh, mankind will become like ourselves. And what did they mean by this? Well, they basically meant they were talking about the apotheosis this is where men become like gods. And this is the creation of a holographic culture, a culture that is able to go outside of the physical restraints of reality. So the holographic culture would be able to go to different star systems. They would have deconstructed time and space. And also they would therefore understand the imaginal realms, which is connected to the spiritual realms. And so would have access to speaking to the dead, for example. And, and the realm of ultimate ideas, of, of ideas, of all the ideas that there ever will be and ever has been and what will be in the future and what was in the past. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, the, the secrecy part, I, I get what you're saying. You know, I, I agree that, you know, we're, we're all human and, and divine, at least some of us are, right? But that, you know, to have secrets, it just seems like you have militaries, you have governments. You know, I, I've owned my own business for several years and, you know, there's secrets that, I wouldn't say secrets, but there's things I don't tell my employees. You know, there's things I share with my wife, who's my partner, but there's things that I keep from my competitors. And, you know, I don't publish on the Internet and I'm not going to let anybody know about certain ideas because we live in this type of society, you know, business wise. And then, of course, you have different countries and you have militaries and you have stuff like that. And then you have, you know, the world, as I had mentioned, I'm like you, you know, living in the United States and. You know, I, I rent a house here. I don't even own my house. You know, I lease my car, you know, like a lot of people, some people own or so forth. But, you know, we're all kind of the same. But, you know, you see this crisis like we're having now with the coronavirus and, you know, all the grocery stores and everybody's just hoarding things and yeah. literally attacking each other to, to get food for, for nothing. So 
mm. you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of torn because I, I see a lot of people that can't control themselves. Well, I you think know. also this is a cultural thing as well because uh, my wife's Japanese and I think that in Japan there's more social cohesion. So I think that they'd be able, this, they're much better at dealing with a crisis like this than what uh, a Western country would be. So I think we're seeing that in terms of um, our systems of governments and our structures. I know that the Japanese government is, shall we say, more authoritarian. Um, but they do have the social cohesion to be able to deal with this very effectively. And I think, therefore, that the death rates of this virus will, in my opinion, will affect more of the Western countries than the Far Eastern countries. That's my that's my opinion. Um, in terms of um, secrecy, yeah. I mean, yeah, I understand why um, nations wouldn't be sharing... Um, secrets about nuclear weapons or magnetic weapons which could destroy the solar system for example i understand that um, but we're talking about secrets which have been used to control human beings and to control humans in a very negative way so this is really what i'm talking about and i do see that the secret society network which have hoarded this information and so i'm only scrapping about at the scraps of information and yeah, yeah. I've, and I, I've, I want I, I want to play a little devil's advocate there because um, again I, I just want to keep touching on that and I'm sorry to interrupt you know because there is inf we have information out there I know everything isn't published but you know there's mm -hmm. research that all of us could could find and you also had mentioned there's there's different factions of mm -hmm. the Illuminati and it feels like you know you have certain again conspiracy um, researchers and alternative history guys that are saying. You know, there's disclosure coming. You know, the good side of the Illuminati is is going to take control, and then you have talks of the white yeah. and the black brotherhood, and then them uniting. The um, so, like, so no, I wanted to just kind of just just finish there. Is that it, it doesn't seem like it's all bad all the time, and it's always going to be like that. But there are different factions controlling maybe the the dark side or the bad, and then there's also good. But to seem like we're going to have this type of prison planet that's a, a perpetual hell for everyone doesn't seem wise for any of the brotherhoods that, that might be controlling, whether, you know, it's the Illuminati or whoever. And um, it just doesn't seem like that would be wise. Have you ever thought about that, Pierre? I, yeah, I've thought about this. I mean, I think that elements of this control structure, and I, I'm not going to stereotype the seraphim because um i think that some of the seraphim want humanity to represent themselves um so yeah i i'm sorry i've just uh, this happens occasionally sometimes i lose my train of thought it's quite it's quite late over here at the moment but sorry just repeat the question again and i'll attempt to answer it yeah so no um you know you kind of focused more on the negative side meaning that everything is, is bad that is being done um to humanity and it and you also mentioned before um different factions you know and i also understand it through my own research and you know talking to different researchers and professionals and masons and illuminati and so forth mm. over the years mm. is i understand that there's a black white brotherhood different factions and so forth mm. but that they're uniting and that the idea isn't always to have a perpetual hell where it's as you state, and it's to keep humanity down. Yeah, um, that there is actually a faction, possibly um, for you had mentioned the seraphim, maybe for humanity or, or for something else rather than uh, what we have now, and it's perpetual war and and hell. You know. Um, so, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. Okay. I I think that there are elements of uh, the, uh, the the seraphim which are hierarchical. And therefore, they're trying to control both sides. And I think that um, they're obsessed about control. And so they control the good elements and they control the bad elements. You see, to use an analogy, if you've got somebody within a secret society, right, um, and let's say they're a pedophile, then you've got leverage. You can control that person. But there's no, but sometimes, and that is required if you want something done. But of sometimes. Course. But sometimes you need to have a, a totally decent, honourable person with integrity, because you need you need them to follow through, and you need them to, their word to be their bond. And you want so you, so you also need to control the good people as well. And this is yeah. what they're doing; they're controlling all sides. And so I think this is um, 
that this is what we're dealing with. I, I think when you go further out into the universe and you look at extraterrestrial cultures, and of course I'm only speculating here because um, I don't, I'm not in the circle of knowledge and I'm not a part of any secret society. And I know sometimes people have accused me of being a part of the Illuminati. I'm not. I don't agree with secrecy. I would never join a secret society. I think this is a part of the problem, is that all of this secrecy. So I think this is the problem. But I, I think when you look at um, these um, different extraterrestrial civilizations, most extraterrestrial civilizations, and I'm going now on from what I've studied about evolution, that they move towards balance, they move towards equilibrium. They're neither terribly spiritual or terribly aggressive. They move towards what you describe as balance, as the, as the Tao. But um, some species are incredibly predacious and are incredibly controlling. And these are the ones who want to be at the top of the um, of the pyramid. And this is why, although we may have multiple species of, shall we say, aliens visiting the planet, uh, the representation of the serpent keeps on appearing over and over again. And this is because this planet is controlled by this faction. And they, if you like, they're a type of um, federation. They control the planet. And therefore, if other races are coming, and the anecdotal evidence is clear on this, that they are definitely visiting, then there probably are strict protocols. Meaning that they have strict protocols right now and they're, they're tightening... And I could, yeah, meaning that if I had a private airplane, I couldn't just fly over China or America. There are protocols. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Mm. You, know, and I, you know, I wanted to you know, disclose to you that you know, I myself am a, a Freemason now and then also um, part of the Ur Illuminati. And, uh, you know... I'm the chief inspector for California, and this is something new after a certain amount of years. And I want to let you know, Pierre, that I'm on the side of good and, and humanity and good things happening. Of course, I can't disclose everything that's part of the, the brotherhood, but we have a, a book written by our grandmaster, The Meaning of Bo uh, Being Illuminati, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Nicholas Laos. And, Quite. you know, yeah, no, and I, I would never align myself. And again, you, you might think different. And again, I just wanted to be honest with you and then that's with my great. audience. No, that's great. But I actually told you that, remember what I said about the Illuminati and this controlling faction, that they want to control the very decent and the very honor, honorable people and sure, uh, sure. the very evil. I, the reason why I think that my father was invited into the Knight Templar was that he was given a decision to make. This decision... He, he, this decision would lead to him being killed. This, this is what he thought. So basically, he, when he was in the army, he was um, sending people to interrogation centers in the Middle East, um, which were terrible places. And um, basically, he told the Red Cross he, um, about the existence of these um, interrogation centers. And... Um, he expected to die as a result of it. Uh, my understanding of this, and I can, on, I can only construe this through deconstructing the language which he, he told me, but as a result of this, he was taken by the Allied forces. He was tortured. He was strung up. He was beaten. He, he was drugged. Um, and, but I think that's probably why they chose him, because he'd, he'd earned the, shall we say, He'd, he'd earned that position. So, for example, the Knight Templar would be chosen by men who'd earned the position that they were prepared to die for their principles. So, yeah, if we, so yeah, if we look at history, I mean... The um, in the very, so the very best and the very worst um, yeah. are, are found within these societies. Sure. And, I'm, I'm kind of interested um, because obviously um, I'm kind of um, a very insular researcher. Most of my research is based upon um, linguistics. I mean, obviously I do touch upon um, 
politics and mythology. But I'm kind of interested in what your take is on on my work, because obviously you're coming from a tradition which is very complementary to what I'm actually uh, talking about, but I'm maybe talking about things that you have maybe not heard of before because you haven't studied the etymologies. Maybe you have, or maybe you've got different insights on on this. So I'm kind of interested in what you think about uh, the research and the et- particularly the etymological research that I've conducted. Well, it fascinates me. I mean, it, it's definitely a, a lot. Uh, uh, above my head, meaning, you know, my understanding of everything, you know, I, I could follow along. I know it's, it's probably really hard for the audience, uh, but yeah, I follow along. I, I know all the terms. I can't be as fluent as you talking about that. I'd say my expertise would be more on research, the, the history, uh, the Bible, um, the bloodlines, uh, my bloodline, you know, going back and studying my own family's history and then going from there and, and finding out different things um, through that, and you know, DNA, biology, um, you know, got, microorganisms, got, hierarchy of microorganisms, uh, and you know, uh, stuff like that. So, you know, your research definitely ties more, I believe, like as you'd say, on the holographic, metaphysical level um, of things, and then also the etymology and the history of it, and and the different word plays through the different cultures. Yeah, you know, you 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 could play, you know, you could talk and go from you know, every culture, I think you could explain all the different words and, you know, what they mean. Um, you know, my, again, has, I feel like almost we're tasked with the, these types of things. You know, again, I, I feel I'm part of this bloodline. Um, I don't know exactly where I play in that. You know, I, I told you that I, I've been attracted to it for the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. I feel I wasn't ready at mm-hmm. the time when I first started to get to where I'm at now. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, would I say I, I am prepared to die for some of my ideas or what we stand for? Mm-hmm. I would say, yeah, um, compared to some of the other ideas that I'm, I'm hearing in other people um, in the world when it comes sometimes to politics and so forth. And um, mm-hmm. again, if you read the book, these ideas are, are exactly what everybody wants for the world. Um, but I see it going a different way. You know, we're more on the conservative side of things as opposed to liberals. So you'll hear that and more mm-hmm. new politics. It's, it's called the third way. Um, you know, it's beyond the black and the white brotherhoods. So we're synthesis looking of, the synthesis of political ideology, which we're moving towards, which is the synthesis of the dialectic, which has been talked about for thousands of years. So I, so that's why you had talked about alliances and I was trying to focus on that because that's where I'm at and that's where we're at as a brotherhood is yeah. doing that. Um, so we're big on, um, you know, bringing those ideas, um, to the forefront and being proud to do that and, and let people know who we are and what we stand for. But at the same time, it is dangerous because there are different other factions and different brotherhoods that, that, that don't want this. Well, you're part of a political party where I'm standing as an independent, (laughs) but, um, maybe we, um, have similar objectives. I just want to see humanity thrive and I just... And I do believe that human beings, they are, for the most part, are thoroughly decent. And I think most of the atrocities in the world are are created through um, ignorance. I mean, the Greek word for ignorance is the same as death. It's related etymologically. So ignorance leads to death. And and this is important. We We have to educate ourselves. I mean, also, there are, there are bad people in the world. But again, a lot of the really bad psychopaths in the world, this is due to sort of like biological damage to their brains. You know, they're, they're not wired up properly. So again, it's very difficult to say um, how much that they're responsible because there's a, a biological impairment there. There's something sure. wrong with the biological machine. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, yeah, I just... No, I, what I want to add on the on the political side, um, you know, I, I was always against, you know, getting involved in any type of, um, you know, politics or anything. And I, I wouldn't say we're a political order, but we're the scholarly and political order of the Earl Illuminati. So it's obvious um, what we're, we're talking about. And I believe that in order to change the world to the, the point where we want it um, for the good, that we need to get involved in, in the politics eventually. And um, that's somewhat of the goal, you know, um, and to have other people that are controlling it and to take them, take us where they're taking us um, is not the goal. So, 
Yes. Well, I, I don't disagree with um, that. I mean, uh, myself, I've been, I mean, I've, I haven't voted for um, any of the political parties in the, since I was 19 years old. Um, so I became very disillusioned with the political system. But that doesn't mean that I haven't been involved. I did write um, several um, reports to my local council about fluoride, which was several hundred pages. And I also wrote two reports about fracking as well, which was uh, several hundred pages. So I would say that I've probably been politically engaged more than most people, whilst actually remaining quietly outside of the system. But it kind of then frustrates me that some individuals will then say, you know, you haven't voted, so you don't have the um, the right to the vote, right, yeah. mm-hmm. which which is ridiculous. Because I would say that there are different ways of participating. You don't have to participate within the system to actually participate. And in fact, some of the most um, political, the greatest political agitators and the um, greatest political movers of change have been people who've operated outside of the system. Now, don't right. get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I think grassroots movements are often inter- infu- infiltrated. And again, the terminology grassroots is coming from neo-footers, which are the ne- uh, newly planted, which again has uh, messianic uh, connotations, as would a plant. A plant would be, again be one who is planted. Um, so uh, again, it's kind of found within the language, as with the word revolution. Of ofan is a wheel, panar is to turn. Again, it has a connotation of. Uh, the opening wheels, which connotes the angelic host. So I do think that I refer to them as the parallel society. I think that they're actively engaged within human politics. I don't buy this rubbish that they're just like passively watching. They're not watching. They put us on this planet and they've been engaged and actively engaged for millennia. I personally think that they do sometimes effectuate, shall we say, um, opposition and i think that they do this because they're interested in emergent systems so taking away food or economies or creating division uh leads to these emergent systems which leads to uh, human ingenuity and creativity i mean obviously unfortunately our creativity is sometimes used in a very negative way to kill human other human beings which is uh, as of a consequence of uh, warfare and i mean this is a shame isn't it you know, the Second World War gave us uh, nuclear energy. And, uh, you know, and it just seems strange to me that um, why, you know, with electricity, we uh, you look at the sky, you see electricity through water particles bombarding each other. And it's like, why would you spend a trillion dollars trying to invent the nuclear bomb when you have electricity, that this can be harnessed? And why wasn't that amount of money spent constructively to try and make this a better world? And so I think this is a real frustration, you know, is the misapplication of knowledge. Yeah, could I mean, if we look at history, when I research the the you know, hiding of knowledge and the hoarding of it and changing of languages and writing. It looks like it was always done under the guise of war. You know, we had Rome who conquered Greco um, Egypt at the time and they changed the calendar and then they changed the language to Latin, you know, confusing the tongues. And, you know, they talk about it, Babylon, right? And all these different nations and so forth. And then now, we have it to the point where in 2020 here, right, uh, after Augustus Caesar started this, you know, my understanding, the sixth age, you know, mm-hmm. so it was started by, you know, Augustus C- Caesar, who adds July for, you know, Julius, is, who I believe was his father, and August and so forth. It seems like we're still, you know, in that era of war, but it has to end sometime. And, you know, when I research it, they talk about the different ages so it seems like this, this, yeah, this this Illuminati plan has oh. been going on for different ages and so forth. But we're we're getting to the end, and we see this coronavirus and plagues mm-hmm. are always part of the apocalypse, brother. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. well, the work of ages, opus is to work, office is a serpent, and um, ops, which is the eye, which are the watchers, which the work of ages is signified by the watching eye, which are the seraphim, which again goes back into the messianic builds which are related to the builders who are the engineers which were the genetic and the social engineers of um, mankind so yeah it seems to be coming to what's ahead in in some respects and this is part of the synthesis it's the part of the restructuring um christians refer to this as uh, the kingdom of god don't they um which is the new atlantis um if, if you're an occultist 
So the very interesting times. I, I mean, at one level, we're at year dot. And I say that we're at the year dot because we have the computer and we have the internet. And in some respects, this is a game changer because it does allow for the um, propagation of information. Obviously, it's a double-edged sword because there's also a lot of um, disinformation. And I think that you certainly find this within the secret societies. And you also find this within... Um, the new age and in terms of particularly modern um, mythology you know like Nibiru and or and the Akkadian and the Sumerian a lot of this is uh, in written in veiled language it's a new type of um, religious and codified discourse it's a type of allegory allosagoria other speaking well what do we really mean by the others the others are the angels so allos uh, means other or another Allosagoria, other speaking, as we said, Puthonagoras was Pythagoras, which is the serpent speaker. So the allegories refer to the others, and again, the others are represented with Allos, which is an halo, which is um, referring to the Illuminati, uh, which has a strong connotation of Sirius, the Ben Sira, those who are born of a boat, but Sira, the Hebrew word for a boat, is Sira, which is um, the Arabic word for Sirius. And, and again, the halo would connote an angelic sailor. Um, alias, which is a sailor or a fisherman. So let me, let me tell you this, Pierre, you know, you always hear, you know, I want to kind of share my experiences. You know, mm -hmm. when my last son, Archer, was born, he's uh, three years old, he's going to be four now. And he's born and uh, my wife had a C-section. We were in New Mexico at the time. But long story short, I hear the nurse, she's going, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then she goes, come here, come here. And she's telling the other nurses and guys there, and I'm like, I'm getting scared as the father because I'm handing up, standing my wife. And she goes, look at the size of that head. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, and I had to go over there, and I'm like, oh, my God. It was really big. <laughs> I mean, it, I've never I, – <laughs> it's my sixth son, you know, but his head – literally look like an alien head you know <laughs> i was like oh my god <laughs> so, well, you just the bloodline i don't know I mean, <laughs> you you said yourself that you became interested in your own origins was this because you joined um this um, secret order and then you wanted to trace your bloodline thinking that well maybe because no, I no, uh, this this is actually just recently after ten years and and different research and connections. No, and in the beginning it was really I'll, I'll tell you, it was listening to Alex Jones and he was talking about his bloodline, you know, and I was kind of into conspiracies and he was like, you know, my bloodlines come from the Mayflower and we started the United States and you should wow. find out where your family comes <laughs> from, you know, on this podcast. And I was like, right. where the hell did my family come from? And it really started with him saying that, and then. You know, a couple months later, I, I got one of those DNA tests kind of thing. That's really yeah. where the interest started. I had no idea. I wasn't into Freemasonry mm -hmm. at the time. It was more on the conspiratorial learning about fluoride in the water. I think it was, you know, watching a video when he was first starting, you yeah. know, 12, 13, 14 years ago, um, you know, when I was in that. And you, you kind of, when you're researching, you find Alec Jones and David Icke and different kinds mm -hmm. of, you know, those videos. And, of course, they're still around, but... Mm. Um, that's kind of how my journey into finding out who I was. And then really, I just researched from there this mm. whole time for the last 13, 14 years. Mm. Well, you see, I think with my father, I mean, remember that he told me that he was, uh, he'd been initiated into the Knight Temple. He described himself yeah. as the last of the last. And again, he described himself as a key holder. I mean, I think the keys also link into um, mind control and conditioning, which would when he'd been tortured so i think there is um an element to to that uh he did say that he was changing some of the keys that the keys that they linked into nine torture chambers and that these torture chambers were found throughout the world um and he basically said you know if you find it throughout the world it's not a coincidence but he said that the, the keys that they'd all been evil and they he'd started to change them because he'd been the first the first who'd actually stood against his nation and basically had stopped uh, the torture from going off and he he believed that that had changed the keys in some kind of metaphysical way but i Interesting. but he and, paid with his life he had said right well he was prepared to pay with it with his life he he didn't because he survived but again some of the things that really occurred were like really bizarre like he told me a story about when he was in the army he he went into the tent and he he went to sleep and then the radio woke him up 
and it was going too far, too far, Foxtrot, or whatever they say on the radio. And they were saying, give your position, you are under every artillery, mortar, and under fire, give your position now. And my dad gave the position. He's going, what are you talking about? We're not under fire. Give your position. And he gave his uh, position, and then he looked around, and he realised he he was at the bottom of a crater, and his camp bed was at the bottom of this crater. His tent had been blown away, and he was at this bottom of the crater just with him and the radio. And so it's like he couldn't understand that. So wow. that's kind of interesting. Yeah, maybe uh, you were handed the keys metaphysically. I I really don't know. Um, it's it's yeah. it's not something well. I guess I chose to do this discipline in terms of my nature of my research. I just want to contribute to humanity. I want to make this a better world. I want hum- humans to thrive. I do want disclosure, and I'm fed up with the secret societies. Um, I think what's very interesting, and I think that my dad was immensely surprised when I said, look, Dad, this is what I wrote. And he he read my book, and he was like, Christ, son, I didn't tell you about any of this. And I, and I don't think he really knew that much because he was initiated when he was 20. And I think he was initiated because of what had happened. He was the bodyguard to the commander in chief of Saudi Arabia, the first sea lord. And I think that he was chosen. I don't really know why he was chosen. I suspect it has something to do with his name, though, like Hague, um, Agios. Um, again, in the Greek, Aeg would be related to a goat and is closely related to Aegis, which is a, a shield, which, uh, you know, the descendants of a boat. But this would be the humanist element. Richard would be um, a rich, rich lord. So, uh, again, in the in the old Norse, Aeg would be connected to a guardian. So a guardian of a rich lord, but would connote this um, um, guardian from this um proto-human element or from this um, carabim. So may, maybe it had something to do with his name, but I mean, I I can only speculate. I'm not in the circle of knowledge, but I, I do think my father was very fascinated by the fact that he hadn't told me any of this stuff and I'd re- wrote a book which was immensely occult. So it was something which surprised him. And when he was dying, he therefore told me that, he'd been part of this secret order of knights, which he described he was the last of the last and that he was part of the House of Lords. Nobody knew about this. He'd been given, he'd, when he'd left the army, he'd been given um, a document and it had a wax seal on it. And he was told that he should never, ever use it unless he really needed to. And he met the chairman of ICI and my father gave him this document and my dad said, I think this document's for you. And he said, I, have you read it? And my dad said, no, I haven't read it. It's, it's all sealed. And, he, 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 and he, he took it and he said, thank you very much. And he, and, um, he gave him free credit and he was able to build his um, business as a result of, of um, this, which he sold ladies' tights. But he got free credit and it was a part of his life when he was a young man that really helped him to develop his business but my father said he never knew what was in that um marked document so yeah interesting that's an incredible story and you know we're going to be wrapping up it's it's been a couple hours here pierre Where, where's the best place for the audience to find your great work and also what do you recommend you have a few books that you've authored the so, first book for maybe someone who's not familiar with your work first yeah, i think that's a very good question i'm the author of two books the murder of reality hidden symbolism of the dragon which looks at the serpent agena the serpent race but it's particularly focused on occult symbolism of um well the ancient priesthood really it, it looks at the ancient priesthood and the serpent priesthood and then i've got the second book holographic culture which is here actually um and this looks at the holographic culture it looks at the scaphological tradition which is the um angelic boat or vessel which are equated with these aliens within the religious and the mythological tradition it's it's the missing link within mythology and religion now for your viewers i would recommend that they go with holographic culture number one because it's a bigger book but secondly um I, I just think that, you know, it's a culmination of 15 years of work, of research in, into this field. And, um, yeah, the, there's just not a book like it. It's taken 15 years of going through dictionaries painstakingly and deconstructing the symbolism. So that's what I would recommend. But um, 
uh, it might be quite difficult at the moment to get books out because I, I've got a feeling that this is going to be an issue at, at, at the moment but hopefully you know in, in the future if, if people are interested then I would recommend holographic culture to begin with and then um, yeah take it from there with the murder of reality yeah great and and uh, the best place would your your personal website are you, uh, you okay. yes appears about books but also um, you can go on YouTube as well because I've got a YouTube channel and uh, there are numerous interviews which I've done with different luminaries from XL Politics in Great Britain and also um, there's uh, a lot of different videos about my different thoughts on the different angelic factions, the symbolism within the Bible, the Apocrypha, different angels, the scaphological tradition, the pa I talk about extraterrestrial controlled governments, parallel society, the ancient saucer cults. Um, so it's all there on YouTube and so definitely um, if people are going to have a little bit of time on their hands if let's say that work is um, sparse at the moment then uh, I definitely recommend to educate yourself because so I think certainly what I'm talking about there's a lot of people who won't really have heard about this because it's very obscure it is based on real hard work and determination to try and get to the bottom of this Thank you for your time, Pierre. I know it's getting late there. Uh, you've been generous for the last couple hours. We had some technical difficulties at first. So thank you for uh, pushing through and, and giving us this great knowledge. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I think my twin brother will be um, overjoyed when he um, finds out that I've been on your show. So thank you again. You're welcome. And it's great to have you on. Tell him I said hello. And thank you for the kind words and his support. Maybe we'll have you on in the next six months or so. That would be lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Take care. Bye.